just a few seconds, we will be hearing from Alice Gaynor because she has just arrived. Yeah. And we can only imagine what the drama was like for her standing there. It really not just a, a moment, but a moment of American history. Alice, you just walk by. We can be yeah. informal here. And let me get, <laughs> and if you step up over here, sure. Alice Gaynor, who just was in the courtroom yeah. with the president, former so president. I'm going to hold the stick mic back and forth here, Alice. But obviously, here's Alice. She was inside that courtroom, as we stated. And I guess first and foremost, we've got a lot to break down. But what was Trump's demeanor like during those proceedings? He was very serious. You know, he walked in, uh, seemed to be all business. He had no real expression on his face. He looked straight forward. The entire courtroom was full of press. It was full of media. I actually didn't see any members of the public. Uh, so we were in one row off to the right. There were five rows, uh, five of us per row. And then there were a ton of court officers, probably about 20. So the other side, same, same deal, five rows, five press members per row. Um, but he didn't look at any of us. You know, I, I'm not sure what we were expecting. He walked in surrounded by all of his attorneys. We know he just added another lead attorney, Todd Blanche, former federal prosecutor, to his team. Uh, Susan Nicholas was there. She presided over the trial for the Trump Organization, so we've seen her in action before. Um, also, uh, Mr. Takapina was there as well. Uh, as for the prosecutors, we had uh, Susan Hoffinger, who also was a prosecutor for the Trump Organization trial. She was in there uh, as well. So this all got started a little late, as arraignments typically do. <laughs> uh, so it didn't start quite at 2.15. So Mr. Trump came in, um, and then we had an attorney for about 30 news organizations trying to argue to have the members of the press, the eyes and the ears, have video cameras in court. So that there was no cameras, but there were still photos. There were still photos, correct. Those should be coming out shortly. About five still photogs were in court. Court. Right. Um, there was also members of the media in other overflow rooms as well. They might have had a better angle of his face, uh, the way the cameras were streaming in, because actually we could barely see him once he sat down. We saw his expression when he walked in, but once he sat down, he was surrounded by officers. We were all shifting around in our seats trying to see what he was doing. But, you know, he kept pretty calm. We're used to him being boisterous, saying all kinds of things at, you know, his press conferences on social media. But obviously we're uh, in a courtroom. This is a court of law. And so, as such, his uh, demeanor was respectful. Um, I want to go over a couple of things. So, around 2.42. Pardon me, I have my notes. <laughs> 242, the judge said, quote, let's arraign Mr. Trump, please. 34 counts, falsifying business records in the first degree. How do you plead? He said, not guilty. We know he was fingerprinted. The indictment was unsealed at 1.30 today and given to counsel. Um, again, 20 court officers. Let's see. Um, Hold on, got notes here. Was Literally the, just walked out. <laughs> I'm just curious, as this as this proceeding was moving on, was was the former president taking notes? Was he conferring with his lawyers? We did see him talking to some of his attorneys, but again, it was so hard to see him. I mean, it seemed like every time you shifted and maybe got an angle of him, a court officer, Secret Service would shift around and sort of block your view. So that was frustrating because we couldn't really see his demeanor and his facial expressions during any of this. But we definitely saw the judge. We definitely heard uh, from both sides, both parties here. Um, so you know that indictment. Talking about concealing illegal conspiracy, other violations of election laws. Um, they were talking about his participation, his alleged participation in an unlawful plan to identify and suppress negative information before the 2016 election. Uh, this is about covert and illegal payments at the defendant's direction over an alleged sexual encounter, a reimbursement series of disguised monthly payments mischaracterized for tax payments. This was the prosecutors. They were going over all of this. Um, then they actually brought up his social media posts and the concern about those and their potential to incite violence. They wanted to file a protective order for discovery. So what the prosecutors wanted was basically when Mr. Trump sees the discovery that they present for his case, they want to make sure that he's in a room, either at his attorney's office or in their presence, and he can only look at it then. He can't make copies. He can't talk about it. They did not request a gag order. I know that was talked about. They didn't request that, and the judge said even if they had, the judge would not have granted that. So actually what the judge said for both parties was he wanted both of them. Let me get the quote for you. Again, bear with me here. Okay, judge said, speak to your witnesses, both sides. Remind them to please refrain from making statements likely to incite civil unrest. And you know, I'm hearing the crowd going right now. There were a couple of times in that courtroom we did hear the crowd. We could hear the crowd. We could actually hear the crowd a couple of times. So again, no gag order. Uh, the judge was at just asking both sides because the de defense stood up and said, "Well, you know, Mr. Trump feels like this was unfair, and he's been making forceful statements because he thinks this is an injustice, and he's, you know, justified in doing that." The judge said, "Well, I don't think his rhetoric." what you're saying is justified, um, but I would encourage both sides to tell your clients. And then the defense brought up, well, you've got Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. They're out here talking. You know, that's not exactly fair. So um, that was one thing that was brought up. You know, normally in arraignment, 
five minutes, right? It, it's usually pretty quick. But they had some issues to go over here regarding this case. Did, did Mr. Trump, I mean, there is always one point when the defendant is asked to speak. Did you hear his voice? We heard his voice when he said not guilty. Um, he was also read some Parker rights, making sure he understood things. And he said, I do, you know, small phrases like that. I mean, we really didn't hear much from him and we really didn't see him. So we're going to have to wait for those still uh, pictures. And again, the still photogs that were in court, they were allowed to take pictures before the proceedings started. So we don't know his reaction as this was all going on. And as far as Alvin Bragg, um, his participation in these court proceedings, what, what did that look like? He walked in. He was in there as well, but he was sitting in one of the rows, you know, in the gallery as well. Um, his prosecutors were up there doing their thing, but he was there. He was in attendance. And well. you, did you see any interaction between the former president and Alvin Bragg? Oh, absolutely not. No. I mean, so uh, Mr. Trump, former President Trump, was sitting there. There was a court officer, officer, excuse me, my Jersey accent coming out, court officer uh, directly behind him. And then, so we're in these benches, and at every bench, there was a court officer to the side. As well. I mean, our view was really obstructed. It was, you, you, you know. You know your way around a courtroom. You've seen your share of courtroom drama. This had to be drama extraordinaire with the former president of the United States walking in. Just describe what was that like. It was a weird energy, I have to be honest, because, you know, we're used to going in there. These arraignments are quick, other people are being arraigned. And, you know, I covered the Harvey Weinstein trial, and we were talking about similarities with that. Um, when he was here uh, being sentenced, there were about 14 court officers, I'd estimate. We also couldn't see him, they were surrounding him. As well. So that was similar, but just the way they were spread out in the courtroom, and then of course the addition of Secret Service. And we were waiting. We thought it would start right at 2:15 because you know they're with security, but it did start a little bit later. And so there was this energy. We kept turning to the door every time the door would open, and um, so it was almost anticlimactic when he walked in because we had already been turning and thinking he wasn't coming in. It was sort of quiet, and the door opened, and then it was oh there he is. Um, but he looked you know straightforward. Didn't look at any of us. Did the judge um, comment anything about the social media? Media post that the former president has been putting out there regarding the judge, regarding the district attorney. Was there any comment in regards to that from the judge? Any warning to it the was, former president? It was just that one. Um, what he had asked both sides to ask both, um, you know, both of your witnesses, your defendant, you know, please refrain. But he did not put an order out there. The prosecutors were talking about, you know, these threats. Um, this language has been directed at um, the DA. You know, members of people's family were. Were really concerned about that, but they did not ask for a gag order either. Um, but they wanted to mention we'd really like, you know, so as not to taint the jury pool either. They don't want any of the evidence and discovery getting out there, so they really don't want him going and um, posting on Truth Social and, and talking about any of that because obviously. I mean, everyone in the world knows about this trial, so any jury pool can't walk in there and say, I don't know anything. I've never heard of this case and before. And he was putting a few out on his way down to the court. I'd speak to, uh, I don't know, were you able to see him leave the courtroom only because you kind of wonder, when we saw a video of him walking in, he looked somewhat somber by Donald Trump yes. standards, and this is a man who really believes that image is anything, is everything. Did you get the idea but when he was leaving what his demeanor might have been? Same as when he walked right in. It was same thing. You know, face forward, he maybe glanced to the side, but it had this look of seriousness almost hunched over a little bit and just, you know, walked out, flanked by Secret Service in front of him and behind him. And the courtroom was silent again. There, were, I didn't notice any members of the public. It was all um, journalists in there, very quiet. We were told to be quiet, couldn't have electronics in there. Um, the attorney representing all the news organizations tried to ask for laptops and, you know, the judge said maybe down the line. Um, and I do want to point out that some dates were set and they're going to be filing motions. They have to do this by August, by September. And then he's expected to be back in court in December. December, December 4th. The defense tried to say, well, this has put a lot of burden on the on New York City and with security and it's been a whole thing. Um, can he possibly waive that appearance? We might file something. And the judge, um, I believe, said that he he would want him to be in here no in the nonsense. courtroom. So December 4th would be the next time he's physically in this courthouse. Of course, the judge could change his mind about that, too. Right. Was there any discussion at all about a change of venue? That was not discussed at all. Not not yet. Maybe perhaps when they start filing these motions, um, the defense was saying, you know, they, they only just saw this indictment, so they haven't really had a chance to go over too much. Um, Put this in perspective, Alice. You, you said you just covered the Harvey Weinstein trial mm -hmm. literally months ago, I guess, and you're looking at this drama unfold here. How do they compare? I would imagine this is perhaps something none of us have ever seen. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of high-profile cases cases, you know, that have been here um, in this courtroom and tried in this courtroom. And for that, there were some barricades, but we were across the street. They had a pen set up for the press. Um, this is, we've never seen anything like this. I mean, we keep saying you can't overuse it enough. I mean, it's unprecedented. This has never happened before. And they want to make sure everybody's safe.
So, right. oh, let me tell you about the courtroom. So, normally you go in, there's a security screening, you walk right in the front here. Well, we walked in, went to the 15th floor, there was another security screening. They really searched through our bags. Um, there were bomb sniffing dogs, whatever else they were sniffing for. Um, again, no phones. They made that very clear. If you were seen with it, it wasn't turned off, you were out of there. And everyone complied. And then we were sitting in the courtroom just waiting. And, and you, you get the sense that if there was a trial, assuming there will be next year sometime, this three ring circus will just carry on and on. And you do kind of wonder what kind of pressure that puts on the city, right? Yeah, that's right. You know, everyone there acknowledged that, um, especially when they were requesting to potentially waive his appearance in December. But um, prosecutors said they would defer to the judge, even though their preference is obviously to have a defendant there in person. Um, but the judge said, you know, he'd, he'd like for him to be there despite all this. I mean, they all said, we, we know this has been tough on everybody involved and very challenging. Um, but it looks like he will be here in December. And the prosecution wanted to push this forward. They wanted a January 2024 trial. The defense said, hey, wait a minute, we haven't looked at anything yet. We, we've got a so, campaign to run. Can you put it off a little? I'll bet they wanted to put it off and put it off. You know, and they mentioned a few times that this man is up for re-election. Um, that was brought up in the courtroom as well. This was, this was as, as far as arraignments go, this was a fairly long, I mean, he started at 242. We got out of there just, you know, a short time ago, so. Getting back to the actual indictment, and if the folks, um, the folks at the studio are actually um, hoping to receive, if they have not already um, received the indictment, to comb through it. But from what you understand, this really does center around those payments mm -hmm, to Stormy Daniels and how they were recorded in the books. Is exactly. that correct? Yep. 34 counts. And we knew ahead of time, we were hearing from sources it would be around 30, well, 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. Now, remember, during the Trump Organization trial, that was two entities under the Trump Organization umbrella. Trump Payroll Corporation, Trump Corporation. Um, this fall, the company was found guilty, uh, tax fraud, and falsifying business records. And again, the prosecutor in this case, uh, one of the defendant, uh, defense attorneys, we saw them in action during that trial. So they're once again having to defend, uh, you know, Donald Trump. Well, Donald Trump wasn't named in the Trump Organization trial. Of course, that is his company, which he signed over once he became president. But they have been defending this falsifying business records charge for a while now. Well, great work, Alice. And I got to say, you talk about a handwriting <laughs> expert. I mean, how you wrote that down. That, that's a true true court officer in your next career. And now I have to go decipher all this so I can make you, better sense of it, it for everybody well out there. Since we're the eyes and ears, they wouldn't let us have cameras, but this is what we have to do. So. Right. Thank you, Alice. We mm -hmm. appreciate that.